In this PowerPoint, we're going to talk about um, probability, and so um, different percentile ranks, z-scores, how to read unit normal table, um, all of that works with probability. Some of the things we're going to learn about again is um, random sampling, some of the assumptions of random sampling, how to use that unit normal table to find your probabilities, um, again percentile ranks or percentiles, right, and then just understanding the definition of what we think um, probability is and how to find probability. So some of the things you need to keep in mind um, and some resources and tools you're going to need is the, um, again, how to work with fractions, decimals, and how to convert that to and back from um, percentages. So how to make a percentage go to a decimal and a fraction, all that kind of stuff. Um, also basic algebra. So the um, your order of operations, you know, what comes first, multiplication skills, that type of stuff. And then also z-scores. You're going to need a unit normal table um, that's in your textbook. And I also have a video that shows you how to use the unit normal table. Okay. So all research usually begins with a question about an entire population. But again, we can't usually get a hold of an entire population, so we usually work on um, or with uh, samples. They're smaller, they're cheaper, they're more accessible. Um, populations are incredibly hard to work with, but samples um, definitely a lot more doable. And inferential statistics is going to use what we learn from that sample, and we're going to try to infer that back to the greater population. We're going to try to use those um, information data uh, to, to answer questions about the greater population. Mm -hmm. And there's a relationship between sample and populations as defined in terms of what we're going to talk about in this chapter, um, probability. Okay, so you start with a population, and from that population you're going to pull a sample, and you do something to that sample, um, or you have them do something, um, sleep deprivation, eat more calories, eat ice cream for breakfast, right? And um, you're going to learn something from them, and you're going to write that down, and then you're going to do that on a couple different samples, and after a while what you can do is you can infer back to the population what um, that sample did or acted like or what kind of attributes that sample had after you did your study on it. And then um, from th that study, you can then start making, you know, predictions, probability predictions on the population on how a sample will react. And so it really is this cyclical um, cycle that, that, this, um, that researchers go through. Okay, probability. So there's, there's always several different outcomes um, that are possible, right? If there was only one outcome, then the probability would be 100% and you wouldn't do any math at all. But the probability of any specific outcome is a fraction or a proportion of all the different possible outcomes, right? So I can have red hair or blonde hair or um, brown hair or gray hair, right? So there would be four different um, possible outcomes, possibilities that could have hair color, right? So to find a probability of me having no red hair, right, probability of A, you take the number of outcomes classified as red hair, right, whatever that variable is, and you divide it by the total number of possible outcomes. In our study, there are four, you know, four different hair colors. So I'd have a 25% chance of having red hair. Right? Okay. Um, P is like a slanted um, off to its side, a little bit P is the symbol um, for probability. And the probability of, of, of a specific outcome is specified by P and then in parentheses, whatever that event is. So probability of red hair, right? Um, the probability of drawing a red ace from a standard deck of playing cards could be as simple as P and then in parentheses, red ace. And um, I know some of my students have never played face cards. With face cards, you have um, 52 cards and you have um, only two that are red aces, right? You have the hearts and you have the diamonds. So we want to find out the probability of just randomly selecting two cards out of a deck of 52 that were both red aces. I would take 2 divided by 52, and that would give me 0 0.038. Or I have about a, about a rough 4% chance of pulling um, a red ace out of the deck. Okay. Independent random sampling. Okay, usually we just call it just random sampling, but independent modifiers is laid off, so you just say random sampling. 
It's a process used to um, describe samples and, and to pull samples from a population. And it's required for our definition for probability to be accurate. You have to do random sampling. You can't um, go around just cherry picking who you want to be in your study. You need to make a good cross section of the population and then pull from that population to get your sample. Okay. Um, we can do um, random sampling with replacement, right? So a sample produced by a process that assures each individual in the population has an equal chance of being selected. Okay, so there's five children, and the five children um, have an equal chance of being selected first in the kickball tournament. Right, so they each have a 20% chance. But as soon as you, you you select one of the children, right, and now you say um, I'm also going to give these last remaining four children an equal chance of being put on the kickball team. Their chances actually go above 20%. Because now there's only four people they have to, or three people they have to compete with. So now their, their probability of being picked is now 25%. So what you have to do is you have to do sampling with replacement. So if you're going to pick Jimmy to be on your kickball team, you have to put Susie in as a replacement. And so that everybody from that original four still has that equal 20% chance of being picked. Probability usually involves population of scores that can be displayed in a frequency distribution graph. So think back to our frequency distribution chapter, I think it was chapter two, right? So um, you can pull your data from that and then um, you can display it in a um, normal distribution and you can get probability from it. Different proportions of the graph represent different proportions of the population. Now, now try to keep in mind that proportions and probabilities are equivalent, right? So. Um, when I say I have a 0.2% chance versus a 20% chance, I'm saying the exact same thing. I'm just, it just sounds a little bit different. And a particular portion of the graph corresponds to a particular probability in that specific population. Okay. So let's do another one. A deck of 52 cards contains 12 royalty cards, so like you know, the kings and the queens and the jacks. If you randomly select a card from the deck, what, deck, what is the probability of obtaining a royalty card? So we still pause while you try to figure that out and then come back and I'll show you the answer. Okay. So again, royalty being the um, one that we're looking for, you would take 12 divided by 52 and you would find your probability. Okay, so this. True or false, choosing random individuals who walk by yields a random sample. And second question, probability predicts what kind of population is likely to be obtained. So we still pause. Okay, check your answers. They're both false. So if you're gonna to go to the mall at 5 a.m. when they open up the wall, mall for cleaners and mall walkers, right? Who usually walks the mall at 5 a.m. when none of the stores are open? Right? So if you live here in Phoenix, this is a, a phenomenon that we have here in the desert where um, the older generation gets up really early in the morning before the um, the mall is open. They walk around the mall, and they're called mall walkers, right? And they do it because it's not hot outside, and it's cool, and it's you know safe. There's security guards there, and but but what color tennis shoes do you think they're all wearing? Right? They're probably all wearing white, right? So if I'm just going to randomly select people that are walking by me at 5 a.m. on I don't know, Tuesday to mall, right? I'm going to say, well, yep, the majority of people wear white. Well, that's not really being random, right? Because there's more people out there that wear you know, shoes than people that walk the mall at 5 a.m. on Tuesdays. Same thing if I went to a university campus, right? If I go to um, university campus and I see everybody walking around in flip-flops, right, because it's hot outside and they're, and, and they're just, you know, kind of casual teenagers, well, then I'm going to think that every person wears Flip-flops, that's not true either. Same thing if I walk down um, Fifth Avenue, right, high heels and maybe like a financial district in Chicago, you know, black, shiny um, shoes, right? And so what you have to do is you have to try to get a random sample of every person who qualifies for that. So in this case, anybody who wears shoes, it's a pretty big sample. Second one, false also. So this one talks about the probability of predicting um, what kinds of population is likely to be obtained to know. Population is given. Probability, probability only predicts what kind of sample what the sample characteristics or attributes are likely to be. Okay. So normal distribution is a common shape, right? Again, it's symmetrical, so the left-hand side looks like the right-hand side, with the highest frequency, right, piling up there in the middle. 
and then towards the end, those frequencies tape, taper off in the tails toward the extreme, extreme sides, right? The far right or the far left. It is defined by an equation. You don't need to know the equation for the normal distribution. Um, but it can be described by proportions um, of area contained in each section. And z-scores help us identify those sections. Right? We talked about z-scores in a previous chapter. But knowing the z-score allows us then to know the probability of, of you getting that exact score. And so again, this is the equation for the normal distribution. Um, you don't need to know the equation, so you don't need to write it down, but just know that this is a mathematical way of getting this shape in, in this distribution. Okay. So this is the normal distribution. And again, um, on the right-hand side here, and again, the right-hand side looks like the left-hand side, 34% of the people will have a score between average of perfectly average, so a zero Z, and one standard deviation above the mean. Right? And then watch how it tapers off. Only 13% have a chance or a probability of pulling a one random sample about a person that has a score, um, you know, positive one to positive two standard deviations above the mean. Right? And then it tapers off even further as it goes on. Okay. Um, sections on the left-hand side of the distribution have the same area, again, corresponding to the sections on the right, so it's symmetrical. And because the z-score is to find the sections, the proportion of the area applied to any normal distribution, right? regardless of the mean, regardless of the standard deviation. Okay. So in this one, you have, um, I don't know, 500 is the average, right, with a standard deviation of 100. When I convert that to z-scores, my average is now 0, right, because then I can show negative and positive. And then if I have... a score of 700, that translates into a z-score of 2, right? Because it would be um, 100 and 100 plus on top of 500, so that would be, give me 700. So again, the shape isn't changing, just the numbers um, do. Um, the unit normal table. And again, I have a whole video on how to read the unit normal table. So this, if you haven't seen that video yet, is going to get a little bit fuzzy, but it'll make a lot more sense whenever you watch the video. Okay? So proportion for the z-scores, only a few of them can be shown graphically, right? But you can have a z-score um, of like 1.3794, right? You can have a z-score of 2.698, right? That gets crazy after a while. So instead of trying to calculate each individual score, we have a table to kind of give you a shortcut. Okay, and this table is called a unit normal table. And you're going to get about, you know, five, six, seven tables throughout the semester. This is your first one, right? And you can find this table at the end of your textbook. So if you bought a physical textbook, at the very, very end of your textbook, it's there. Um, you can Google it, unit normal table. Um, and, and I also have um, it in the, in the video, too, okay? So this is what, kind of what it looks like, well, is what it looks like. Um, you have a couple different columns here. In this first column, column A, is your Z. Right? This is your Z-score. So if I can have a Z-score of 0.21 or 0.32, now this keeps going to infinity. Now most student tables go up to 4. The one in your textbook goes up to 4. And this is just a part of it, right? So if I have a Z-score of, I don't know, 0.24, Right? That tells me I have proportion in the body of 0.5948, or around 60%. Right? And then the proportion in the tail is 0.4052. The last column, column D, is proportion between the mean and the Z. Okay? So look over here on the right-hand side. This one, again, when you think tail and body, you think the bulk of the tail, or bulk of the distribution is the body. And a little bit inside over here is the tail, okay? So if I have a z-score on this side of the mean, I know automatically I have a positive z-score, right? And anything on this side is going to be the smaller number, and anything on this side is going to be the bigger number. So say this is, I don't know, a z-score of 1, right? I would look at my um, unit normal table, and I would say, okay, a z-score of 1 gives me a proportion of the body, the bigger part right here, as 0.84, right? And then the proportion in the tail is 0.185, or 0.1587, meaning what is the probability that I'm going to randomly select somebody in that population, and they're going to have a score greater than this one right here, about 15-16%, right, versus like 85, 84% over here. Okay? The opposite is also true. So if I have, a, again, a z-score of... Um, 
found that. Let's go like 1.5. Right? If I have a z score of 1.5, I can say in the tail, right? So on like the little bitty side right there is 0 0.068. So I've got a six and a half percent chance of randomly selecting somebody who has a z score higher than 1.5. And then over here in the body is um, you know 0.933. So 93 percent chance of randomly selecting a score one score um, out of that whole population that is lower than that. Okay, so this is z scores corresponding to plus or minus 2.5. So on the left hand side here we have a z score, oh this should say plus 0.25, that's a typo, sorry. So positive 2.5, so it's on the right hand side of the of the mean. I have a tail of 0 0.4031 and a body of 0 0.5987. Watch how it flips though. If I have a negative z, so negative 2.5, again this should be positive 2.5. If I have a z-score of negative 2.5, now the tail is 0.4 and the body is 0.59. Okay. The unit normal table lists relationships between the z-score locations and proportions in that normal distribution. So if you know the z-score, you can look up the corresponding um, proportion. Conversely, the opposite is also true, right? So if you know the proportion, you can look on the table and find that specific z-score. So you can read it from right to left and from left to right. Okay? And probability is, again, mathematically equivalent to proportion. So we have a couple graphs here. The first one we're going to talk about is um, this one, right? So we have um, a normal distribution, right? z-score of positive 1. Right, positive 1 in the body will give me 84 point, or 0 0.8413, meaning what is the probability of me randomly selecting a score that is less than 1 standard deviation above the mean? That would be 0 0.8413, or 84%. And then over in the tail, the small part here, right? What's the probability of me selecting, randomly choosing, one score that's greater than a z of 1? And that'd be 0.1587 or about 15, 16%. For this one, 1.5, right? What's the probability of me randomly selecting somebody over here? 0.9332, so 93% chance. What's the probability of me just randomly choosing a score? Um, that's higher than, right, so in the tail, 1.5, 0 0.0668, so 6.5%, six, six really, really small. Okay, now we're going to be on, on the negative side here, so we have negative 0.5. What's the probability of me choosing a score greater than negative 0.5? It's 69.15%, right, versus um, what's the probability of me choosing a score less than negative 0.5, and it's only about a 30% chance, 0.3085. So find your unit normal table. Again, you can find this in um, the Gravitor textbook at the very, very end. Most textbooks have it, though. The Aaron textbooks have it at the end. Um, all the textbooks I've ever worked with have it at the very, very end of the, um, of the book. So if you bought a physical textbook, um, go all the way back into the back of the textbook where it says the no unit normal table. Okay, And then find Z of 1.5. Okay, Now the question is, What's the proportion of the normal curve that corresponds to a z-score greater than 1.5? So you're going to be looking in the tail, right? Because 1.5 is already pretty high. 0 0.0668. Yeah, it's super, super small. Let's think about this one. For any negative z-score, the tail will be on the right-hand side. Let's think about it. You might even want to take, get out a piece of paper and just like, draw it down really quick. Make a um, normal curve and make a negative z-score, kind of write down where that negative z-score is, and say, okay, which side is the tail on? Okay. So for negative z-scores, the tail will always be on the left-hand side. For positive z-scores, the tail will be on the right-hand side. Okay. True false. If you know the probability, you can find the corresponding z-score. So what do you think? Do you think it goes both ways? Do you think you can use the unit normal table if you know the z-score, you can find out the probability. If you know the probability, can you find out the z-score? You can. Okay. So again, this is a, like a little screenshot of the z-table, right? So if you know a z-score, you can find out the probability. 
if you already know the probability, you can find out the z-score. So you have to kind of get used to learning how to read right to left. I know we all, or most of us, read left to right, um, but with this table, you can use it both ways. Okay. Probability is given the unit normal table will only be accurate if they are from a normally distributed population. So you need to verify that it's being pulled from a normal distribution first before you even proceed. Right? If it has any kind of skewness, it won't work. Okay, so in this one, you have a distribution of IQ scores. Again, IQ, the average IQ score is 100 with a standard deviation of 15. So if I have an IQ of 120, my Z score is 1.33. I can then bring my table and say, okay, um, 1.33, what is the probability that somebody will have an IQ score greater than 120? So 1.33, it's a 0 0.0918, so um, about a 9% chance. The opposite is also true. If I look in the body, the bigger part of it over here, right, there's a 90.82% chance that I can randomly um, pull somebody that would have an IQ score less than 120. Okay, with this one, what you're going to do is you're going to use the D column, okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to find, um, you're going to use your unit normal table and first look up 0 0.3. So find 0 0.3. And then write down that number, 1 point, or 0.1179. Okay? And then you're going to look up 0 0.7. And you're going to write down that number too. So 0 0.7 is 0 0.258. So you're going to add 0 0.258 and um, 1 or 0 0.1179. And that's the probability of you randomly selecting somebody who has an IQ score greater, whatever we're dealing with here, a, a test score, greater than 55 but less than 65. Okay, percentile ranks. So percentile rank is the percentage of individuals in the distribution who have scores that are less than or equal to a specific score. Okay, and probability questions, they can be rephrased as percentile rank questions, right? So if you're in the 99th percentile, what that means is that you beat 99% of the people that also took that test. If you're in the 20th percentile, that means that 80% of the people that took that test with you had a score higher than yours. So we have here, um, we'll say, I don't know, we have an average score of, um, you know, 58 with a standard deviation of 10. So it goes, um, should go 58, 68, 78. So the, the full typo, sorry. Okay, so um, you have, we'll count like 55, 65, 75. So you have um, the first one at 0. 0.7, and so say you have a, a score of 75, right? Well, you'd be in the 95th percentile. And that makes sense, right? Because what, what, what it's saying is you have um, all these people that you scored higher than, and then just this little people over here that you scored um, less than. Okay. I love this graphic, right? It shows this relationship that raw scores have with Z scores that have with proportions, okay? So if you have a raw score, you can convert the raw score by using a Z score formula into a Z score. Once you have a Z score for that raw score, you can then find the probability of it by using the unit normal table, okay? And it keeps going. If you know the proportion, you can find the, um, the raw score, right? It, it, it keeps going. It goes the other way too. So if you have a proportion, you can find um, a Z score and you can find a raw score. Okay. So if this if this one example here, looking at commuting time, and we're saying that the average person commutes for 24.3 minutes with a standard deviation of 10 minutes, um, what you can do is you can actually find out how many minutes you'd have to be in the car to qualify to be in that top 10% range, right, of commuters who really spend a long time in their car. So you'd have to have a z-score of 1.28, and you would be in the car for 37 minutes, and that would qualify you to be in the highest 10%. Okay, splitting. So um, what if we want to look at just the middle 90%, right, again, um, a normal distribution is perfectly symmetrical, so again, the left-hand side looks like the right-hand side. And so what we'd have to do is we'd have to split the tails. So in this 
example, we have two tails. We have one on the far, far left with a z-score of 1.65, negative 1.65. And then we have a tail on the right with a positive 1.65. So you would have to be um, between 7.8 minutes and 40.8 minutes to be in that middle 90% of all commuters. Okay. Membership in Mensa, so it's like the smart persons club, right, requires a score of 130 on a Stanford Binet IQ test, which has an average score of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. So what proportion of population qualifies for Mensa? Who are they looking for? What percentiles? Okay. They're looking for the top two percenters. They're looking to see if you can sit down and take a test and you score better than 98% of all the other people that have taken that test. Right. So definitely um, super, super, super smart. Okay, true or false? It is possible to find the X score corresponding to a percentile rank and a normal distribution. Okay. And the second one is, if you know a z-score, you can find the probability of obtaining that z-score in a distribution in any, of any shape. Okay. So push to pause, think about that, and then come back and push play again. Okay. The first one. Yes, you can find the z-score for the percentile rank and then transform it back to a um, raw score. It's called a new score. Okay. The next one, if a distribution is skewed, right, so you have an outlier maybe pulling the data either right or left, right, positive or negative, the, the probability shown in the unit normal table will not be accurate. So you really can't run a z-score if the distribution that you're pulling your population from is skewed in any way. Okay. Many research situations begin with a population that forms a normal distribution. Most of us will form a normal distribution by ourselves. You can force a norm on it, right? And a random sample selected receives a treatment, right? And then the probability is used to decide whether that treated sample is noticeably different or is statistically significantly different from that population it's pulled from. Okay. So say we have a population of uh, mean of 400, the standard deviation of 20. I pull a sample. I do something to that sample. I give them a new therapy, a new drug. And then that treated sample is then evaluated. Do they have a higher or lower average? Did their standard deviation change? Right. And then once I know about that, I can go forward and say, okay, um, I can infer back. Well, if we did the whole population, the whole population would be better off or worse off if I did that. Extreme scores okay, is anything in the, um, like the tails, right? So in this case, extreme 5%. Right? Scores are very unlikely to, to be obtained from the original population, and um, it usually shows that treatment effect is happening, right? In this scenario, you can have a, two tails. You can do it with a one tail, too. Okay, again, do your homework. Um, email me or text me with any questions.